you something, if you never get up on the inside, you're never gonna get up on the outside. You gotta get up in your attitude and then your body will get up with you. I am so excited about bringing you this message tonight. I've had this for probably six months and I want you to listen like you've never listened before because I want to talk to you tonight about what to do when you need a miracle. And actually the title of the message is, when you need a miracle, wiggle. So we're all going to practice wiggling right now. Now wiggling is not like walking, wiggling is not like running, wiggling is wiggling. So let's just practice. Come on, let's do it both ways. Now, if you need a miracle, wiggle. Now we're going to get around to this pathetic man laying here. I tell you, Steve, you look worse than I thought you would. You're, Thank you. You've really practiced looking pitiful. Yeah. This is the man that I preach about as often as I get an opportunity to out of John chapter 5, who lay by the pool for 38 years waiting for a miracle. To me, it's one of the most amazing stories in the Bible. 38 years is a long time to lay in the same place and do nothing. But first we're going to start in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13. He's perfectly willing to lay there till I need him. Father, I ask you to really anoint this word tonight, and I pray that people are going to get it, and it's going to be life-changing for some people. Can anybody say amen? amen? Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon, who was supposedly had more wisdom than anybody, but Somewhere along the line, he got a case of being very foolish, and he did everything that anybody could possibly do to make themselves happy. He had numerous, numerous women. I don't know why any man would think that numerous women would make them happy when one can usually give you all the problems you could possibly want, but he had numerous women. He built houses, he owned land, he had silver, he had gold, he had servants, he had everything that anybody could possibly want. And he said, it's all useless, it's all vanity, it's all basically chasing after the wind. Then at the very end of the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 12, verse 13, the next to the last verse, he said, all has been heard. The end of the matter is this, fear God, revere and worship Him, knowing that He is, and keep His commandments. For this is the whole of man, the full original purpose of His creation, the object of God's providence, the root of all character, the foundation of all happiness, and the adjustment to all inharmonious circumstances and conditions under the sun, the whole duty for every man. Now I'll tell you, that's a, a long verse in the Amplified. I don't want to take the time to go over it and over it, but I want you to continue to look at this at home in an Amplified Bible. And I want you to realize that God is saying that whatever problem you have, the way to fix it is to do what I tell you to. Whatever problem you have, the way to fix it is to simply, simply, <laughs> quickly and simply, do whatever God asked you to do. And I wish you were a little more excited about that than what you are, but I'll say it again. The way to fix any problem in your life, the adjustment to everything that's out of balance, the root of all character. See, we develop godly character when we do what we know is right, even when it hurts and we don't feel like it. When we do what we know is right, even when we're not getting an immediate right result, we develop godly character when we treat other people right who are not treating us right. 
Ooh, ooh, ouch, ouch, ouch. We need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to develop the character of God in our life. There's nothing more important than having godly character. And that always means that you choose to do what's right, no matter how you feel. In order to enjoy restoration, which we're talking about this weekend, wholeness, healing, and renewed life, we must do more than just pray and wait for God or somebody else to do everything else. We have to learn to be responsible or to respond to the ability that is in us. And I'm going to tell you an ability that you have. You have the ability to do anything that God asks you to do. There is nothing that God will ask us to do that He won't give us the ability to do. Did you hear me? So there's no point saying it's too hard. There's no point saying I can't. If you're going to say anything at all, tell the truth and just say, God, I just don't want to. And I'm just going to go around the mountain another dozen times and see if maybe I can wait long enough to get you to change your mind, which is not going to happen. We have to learn to obey God. Proverbs 6, 5 through 9. Deliver yourself as a roe or a gazelle from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, you sluggard, you lazy person. <laughs> Consider her ways and be wise, which having no chief, overseer, or ruler, provides her food in the summer and gathers her supplies in the harvest. How long will you sleep, O sluggard? When will you arise out of your sleep? Now, the reason why I like that scripture so much is because it tells us that the ant, the little tiny black or red ant that crawls around in the dirt all of its life, the little black ants, when it's harvest, they gather what they're going to need for the time when there's no harvest, and it specifically mentions that, that they do it without an overseer. Now, this is the part I love. They do what they need to do, and nobody has to make them do it. The ant is smarter than a lot of people. That's a beautiful scripture. When we can do what is right, when nobody is watching, and we do it just because it's right and because God said to, we are assured of victory in every area of our lives. Did you hear me? When you go home, you have a mission, and that is to live your life before the all-seeing eye, to live your life before God and God alone. Don't live to please people. Don't live to please yourself. Find out what the Bible says and set your mind that with God's help, you are going to be obedient to everything that you find in the Word and everything He puts in your heart as an individual. And if you do that, you'll never have to be jealous of anybody else. You'll never have to want somebody else's victory because you'll have your own. Well, Joyce, I go to church. <laughs> I went to church for a lot of years before I ever got serious with God. And I, I loved God, not wholeheartedly, but I believed in Jesus. I understood the grace of God and the forgiveness and the mercy of God. My goodness, I sat on the church board. My husband was an elder. And I was so fleshly and carnal. I didn't put a premium on complete obedience. Oh, I, I did some things. There were some things that I did that were right. But I had no restoration in my life. 
I still had the result of all the mess from my childhood. And I was kind of like this guy, just laying around somewhere, waiting for a miracle, looking pitiful and feeling sorry for myself. Don't be deceived into thinking that you're a special case, unlike others, that your hands are tied by your past or present circumstances. We all have some kind of problems. Admittedly, some people seem to have more than others. Some people have some very tragic things happen in their life. But some people whose lives are in the worst messes don't have anywhere near the depth of problems that some other people do who have tremendous victory. <laughs> so what? What's going on? A lot of it's attitude. A lot of it is selfish, self-centeredness. But it always comes back to the promises of God are for whosoever will. Not just whosoever will have the promise, but whosoever will do what God tells them to, and then the promise is assured. If you want to know the truth, I don't think we hear enough teaching about obedience. I said, I don't think we hear enough teaching about obedience. We hear a lot about the blessings. We hear a lot about getting what we want from God. We hear a lot about how to resist the devil. But we need to hear about obedience. The promises in the Bible are for a certain group of people. And we're all in that group. It's a group called whosoevers. And everybody in this room tonight is a whosoever. Amazing scriptures. Whoever believes in him shall be saved. Whoever calls upon his name shall be saved. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, we'd like to put that up and have you look at it with us. The Bible says, arise. And that word means get up and get moving. That's what it means, get up get moving. Arise from the depression and the prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Rise to a new life. Shine and be radiant with the glory of the Lord. For your light has come, not will come, has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. But in order for us to experience that in our lives, the first thing we have to do is get up. And I want to tell you something, if you never get up on the inside, you're never going to get up on the outside. You've got to get up in your attitude and then your body will get up with you. Amen? Now, John chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, and I'm not going to read them all, I'm going to start somewhere about in the middle of that, but I'll share with you what it says. There was a man who lay by the pool of Bethesda waiting for a miracle because every year, once a year only, an angel came and stirred up the water that was in the pool. So it was a pool kind of like this. We're going to pretend like we're in Bethesda. And by that pool, there would have been all kinds of people laying around all the time. And once a year, an angel would come, and I don't know if the angel just put their finger in there and stirred around or what, but it created some kind of miracle water, and whoever was the first one to fall into that pool or to get into the pool while the angel, while the water was stirred up, would receive a miracle, and then I guess the water calmed down and that was it. Only one person, once a year, could get a miracle. Now, Jesus came and there was a certain man, verse 5, who had suffered with a deep-seated and a lingering disorder for 38 years. A deep-seated and a lingering disorder for 38 years. And it's this man right here. 
And Jesus said a most amazing thing to this man. When Jesus noticed him lying there helpless, knowing that he'd already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you want to become well? Well, what kind of a question is that? Do you want to get well? Sure. <laughs> and then Jesus goes a little deeper. He says, are you really in earnest about getting well? And then the most amazing thing, the invalid answered him and said, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. And every time I try, somebody gets in front of me and they get their healing and not me. So when Jesus said to him, do you really want to get well? He said, I have nobody to put me into the pool. He was waiting for somebody to do it for him. You say, well, Joyce, give the guy a break. He was crippled. But well, I want to tell you something. In 38 years, I could have done a lot of wiggling. <laughs> I mean, in 38 years, if you only wiggled a little part of an inch every year, I mean, he had 365 days to wiggle. Just a little bit. But the only thing he could say to Jesus was, there's nobody to put me in the pool. And when I try to get on, somebody gets ahead of me. Now, Jesus didn't say, oh, you poor man. I cannot believe that you have been laying here 38 years and nobody has put you into the pool. That is really terrible. I know. It's really bad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Just really bad. I'm glad you're starting to see things my way. <laughs> yeah, you're, he's getting this. He's actually got, I think, tears in his eyes. <laughs> now, you know, Jesus being loving and kind, I would think that he would have just said, that is the most horrible thing I have ever heard. I am going to fix your problem tonight. But here is what Jesus said to him. Verse 8, Jesus said to him, get up. Get up. Get up. And pick up your bed and walk. Go home with that mess you've made in the last 38 years. Get out of here and live your life. Get up. And I tell you, I don't know how far you've come or what it cost you to get here, but that's God's word to a lot of you. Get up! Quit laying somewhere, waiting for somebody else to come along and do it for you. Feeling sorry for yourself because everybody else always gets ahead of you. Nobody helps you. You got to get up on the inside. And the way you get up on the inside is you say, I don't care what happened to me in my past. Maybe I didn't have a good start, but I am going to have a good finish. I am not going to live a miserable, wretched life. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against me in judgment, I will show to be in the wrong. I'm not going under because I'm going over. You got to get a little fire in your belly and say, I'm a whosoever. And if anybody can be out of debt, I can be out of debt. If anybody can drive a new car, I can drive a new car. If anybody can live in a nice house, I can live in a nice house. And if anybody can obey God, I can obey God. We don't have to sit around and read books in our morning time with God about all the mystics who gave everything and served God. We can serve God with our whole heart.
We can seek Him. We can walk in His presence. We can know Him in the power of His resurrection. We can be world changers. We can be people who help people around the world. Every single one of us. We can get ourselves off of our minds and have a life worth living. He couldn't walk, but he could have wiggled. I don't care what you got wrong with you, you can wiggle. I mean, I've thought about it. In 38 years, I would have made it over to the edge of that pool, and I would have been so close to the water that when the angels stuck their finger in there, I would have fought, fell in and said, I'm drowning or I'm getting healed, but I'm not staying like this anymore. <laughs> Whoever. Jesus said, I myself am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whoever steps out on the Word of God shall never be disappointed and never fail. You got to step out sometimes. We all reap what we sow in life, like it or not. We reap what we sow. And I'm not saying that all your problems are your fault. That's not what I mean. But when you come into a time, and I come into a time where we begin to know God and we learn to do what's right, if you do what's right long enough, you will get a right result. I said, if you do what's right long enough, you will get a right result. If you do what's right long enough, you will get a right result. And that doesn't mean you won't have trials. That doesn't mean you won't have difficulties. That doesn't mean that people won't hurt you. That doesn't mean there won't be people to forgive. That doesn't mean there won't be injustices and unfair times in life. The world is full of mean people. But I'm here to tell you that every time you get hurt, the God who lives in you will heal you. Every time you get pushed down, the God who lives in you will lift you up. Every time you get discouraged, that same God will encourage you. I tell you what, if you get up on the inside, how many of you know what I mean when I say get up on the inside? If you get up on the inside, there ain't nobody keeping you down on the outside. If we co sow consistent obedience, we will change. Our lives will change for the good. If we sow disobedience, we're going to have every kind of misery. Well, what is responsibility? It, re it literally means to respond to the ability that's in you. It is respond-ability. It means to be called upon to give an account of, to answer for, to be liable in case of fault, to answer for your conduct. And what do we do? We make excuses. Well, why are you so grouchy? Well, I had a bad day at work. Well, why are you being so hard to get along with? Well, I don't feel good. That's not being accountable. That's just making an excuse. That's avoidance. And I did that for way too many years. To meet your obligations. To do your duty. To be able to choose between right and wrong. To be accountable. But instead of being accountable, we get confronted with something, and instead of being accountable, we begin to blame, to make excuses, to feel sorry for ourselves. We get stubborn, we get full of bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, all kinds of ugly attitudes and bad things. And very, very much we blame our problems on everybody else. Why had he been there in there 28 years? Nobody would come along and put him in the pool. It wasn't his fault. It was that nobody else came along and did it for him. Why hadn't he wiggled? Because he was too busy thinking about all the people that kept getting ahead of him and feeling sorry for himself because his life hadn't turned out the way he wanted it to. This room is full of people probably whose lives haven't turned out the way you wanted it to, but that doesn't mean your life is over. That doesn't mean you can't have a great life. It may not be what you thought it should be, but I've got news for you. God can make it something better. 
And even if you messed up what plan A was supposed to be, God is so great that He can take a plan B and make it better than plan A ever would have been. And I love that. I love it.